How to make a coal-fired steam engine boiler plant, part 23. Broken belt sander, a present from Sweden, and milling the ash pan opening. I bought this Sealy belt sander because my old one was, well, very old, in January of 2017. And I don't know why it says manufacturing date 03-2014, but anyway, it's broken. Or should I say, the drive belt's broken. I got another one, direct from a company who sell drive belts. I inquired about a replacement via the Sealy website and just got a reply saying sorry they were out of stock and I'm just getting nowhere with the company who supplied the belt sander in the first place, which sadly seems to be the way of things these days. So I looked on eBay and I looked on Amazon and finally I looked on the web and I bought one from a company called Simply Bearings Limited and amazingly the belt arrived in the post this morning. I was quite taken aback by this because it was incredibly quick. All of the belts that I looked at on eBay seemed to be quite expensive at £12 or £15 a time. This one came in including postage at £5 from Simply Bearings Limited. I measured the length of the broken belt and then I counted the teeth and then I went on Simply Bearings Limited and the inset picture shows the serial number that you need to quote if you wish to order one. Another parcel arrived in the post today and this one was from Sweden. And I was a bit surprised by this because I don't remember ordering anything from Sweden. And then for some reason I thought to myself, I wonder if it's a kit of body parts to build my very own Swedish au pair girl. But alas no, it was a set of screwdrivers. And I thought, that's odd, a set of screwdrivers. And then I saw the name at the top. And these are not just ordinary screwdrivers, these are Barco screwdrivers. Who needs an au pair girl when I've got a set of screwdrivers like this to go with my Barco spanners and they say Barco on them? I would like to take this opportunity to thank Martin from Sweden for this most excellent present. And I've positioned this set of screwdrivers in a prominent place in the workshop, so when I'm working on steam engines, not only can I use them, I can look at them when I'm not using them. And once again, all the way from the UK to Sweden, thanks for these, Martin. It's been a pretty good day today for getting things through the post. These also arrived. These are the pieces of mahogany strip wood to finish the condenser. In the last episode, during the construction of this condenser, I ran out of the mahogany strip wood. So I used a generic piece of footage from my How to Build a Model Steam Launch DVD set to finish the episode. But as I really don't like to use the Here's a part I prepared earlier, this is the proper job and I'm actually finishing it. I didn't use the power sander to rub it down, I just used some coarse sandpaper. 80 grit followed by 180 grit. And I took great care not to scratch any of the brass with the sandpaper. And then without removing any of the dust, I used some polyurethane varnish on a cloth to varnish the wood. And no sooner had I covered the wood with the varnish, I used the cloth to wipe it off, because I don't want a high gloss finish, I want like an oiled wood finish. But I generally use polyurethane varnish because it's more durable. Two or three viewers said, why is the condenser covered in insulation? And the answer is, it's more of an oil trap than an actual condenser. And by covering it in insulation, it condenses less. Therefore does not fill up quite as quickly with water. I received a message from a viewer saying to me something like this. I thought you were going to mill out the ash pan to clear the ashes. Well, yes, I am going to do that. I am actually dancing as fast as I can. So, Mr. Viewer, this one is for you. I'm about to mill the slot for the ash pan. This will mean I can rake out the ashes once the boiler is in steam, and I'm really sorry for being inefficient and not doing this earlier. And without further ado, the job begins. And I get the opportunity to use one of the new Barco spanners that Martin sent me to undo the 2BA countersunk bolts that hold the columns to the main cast iron base. And in no time at all, the bolts are removed. So now what I'm going to do is commence the milling process. And to do this, first of all, I need to reverse the jaws in my four jaw chuck. This is a really good quality, old, but very good, Bernard four jaw chuck. And this is the one that came with my Boxford lathe, but these days it tends to live on the rotary table. And it's very useful indeed for holding parts that are going to be either drilled or milled on the milling table. For convenience and mainly to save time, not to mention that I do also of course drill in this machine, I often use a drill chuck for milling because it's a very old drill chuck, its mechanism is very stiff and tends not to work loose, but I only use the drill chuck for light milling operations. This is not exactly a heavy duty milling operation, but if I was to use the drill chuck, 
and the cutter did slip, it would spoil the work, and I don't want to risk that because I would have to start again. When machining cast iron, the same rules apply whether you're using a single point tool, like a lathe tool in the lathe, or a multi-point tool, like this end mill, in a milling machine. The speed that you're watching this at is not the real time speed. This is speeded up 20 times. The real time speed is quite slow, and just so that nobody falls into a coma, I did it this way, so you can see me getting through the work fairly quickly. The whole point of this job is to machine away one section of one side of the ash pan, and that way, by using a suitable tool, I can pull out all the ashes. And at this point, as I'm getting very close to the level of the turned area in the centre of the ash pan, I'm being very careful that the tool does not go too deep. If I take too much off at this stage, the job will just look bad. I'm taking some time out to just double check the measurements to make sure that this recess is exactly in the middle between the two columns. The two scribed lines that are made with the needle file up against the columns are now proving to be very useful. And in what seems like almost no time at all, mainly due to the speed of the video of course, the milling job is now finished. The rest of it is handwork. I don't really mind milling machine teeth mark, they look quite good, they give like a nice pattern, but in this case I want it to be smooth. So I'm using a needle file and two coarse grades of sandpaper. 80 grit which is very coarse and 180 grit which is not quite so coarse. I'm refitting the gunmetal ring to the base because I do need to recess this as well to make it all fit together. And once the gunmetal ring is in place, it's back onto the milling machine. And I'm being really, really careful with this. Gunmetal is quite a soft metal and it's very easy to cut with a milling cutter, but just one wrong turn of the hand wheel and the job could be ruined. And it's much better to be safe than sorry, so I'm finishing off the job with the needle file and the sandpaper as before. These close-up video shots are not very flattering. The finish on this ash pan slot really does look quite good with the naked eye. This clip shows me refitting the ash pan to the boiler. Just a quick word about using screwdrivers. Either good ones like this Barco one, or not so good ones, it's always very important to select the correct head size for the size of slot in the screws. If the screwdriver's too small, you're likely to make a mess of the screw heads. I still have a little bit more cleaning up to do of this ash pan slot, and there's still another part that needs to be fitted in the ash pan, and I'll be showing what that is very shortly. But for the moment, thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful.